Cross Defense. Whoa! Hopefully this is working, and I'm coming through. This is Pastor Brian Wolfmuller of Hope Lutheran Church in Aurora, Colorado. I am your host on this Monday afternoon for Cross Defense on KFUO, your worldwide source for law and gospel, bringing to you the comfort uh, that Jesus wants to give us in his word and in his kindness. Today on the, on the show, we're going to have Pastor Jonathan Fist join us in about 15 minutes. He's going to be talking about his new book, Echo. You recognize his voice, a, a great and profoundly helpful voice uh, in the world today to preach the gospel. But I'm going to talk a little bit before that, uh, as we get the show rolling, about something that's been on my mind, and I'd invite your feedback. You can feed back in the studio at KFUO Radio. Uh, Stephanie's on the board, operating the board, so you can uh, get to her. You can send a tweet to at KFUO Radio or at B. Wolfmuller. I'll check that in about three months. So uh, that would be great. And you can also uh, join us on the show. So we'd love to have you uh, hear your voice as well. And the thing that I want to suggest or talk about today is this distinction between a terrified conscience and a troubled conscience. Now, I, I want to start out at the very beginning by talking about, by, by saying that this is a casual distinction. It's not a, it's not a distinction that we're going to find on the pages of our great dogmaticians. But I think it's very, very helpful. At least I find it to be a very, very helpful thing to consider. The difference between, between a terrified conscience and a troubled conscience. And and let me start by saying that here is as a way to get into it that all of us have a conscience. And our conscience in some ways, I mean, it's a complex instrument that the Lord has given us, uh, this conscience. But the conscience works in one way or another, almost like a, like a home plate umpire. He's not part of the game. At least, you know, if the ball hits the umpire, it's a dead ball. He's, he's not batting. He's not throwing. But the umpire stands behind the home plate, and he's, he is making the call if the pitch is a ball or a strike, if it's good or if it's bad. Now, sometimes the uh, umpire gets it right. Sometimes he gets it wrong. You know, this depends on on the quality of the umpire, and our conscience is the same way. Sometimes we make the right call. Sometimes the conscience makes the wrong call. That was a good work, and that was a sin. But but basically the conscience is there, and it's keeping an eye on the things that we do, the things that are done to us, and it's saying that was good and that was bad. Now, all of us have a conscience. It's given to us in by God in nature, and that conscience is sitting there preaching to us. That that thing you did is a good work, and that thing that you did over there, that was a that was a sin. Now, when the conscience tells us that the thing that we've done is wrong, that, that results in a troubled conscience. And everybody, everybody has a troubled conscience to one degree or another. Unless you're a psychopath and your conscience has stopped working altogether, everybody is able to say, hey, I, I've made mistakes. I've done things that are wrong. It's, you know, we have all these cliches to talk about it, really, in our culture, in our world. We, you know, you hear things like this, uh, nobody's perfect. Uh, no, nobody to err is human. I mean, you you ask people, you just go and ask a person. Hey, have you do, have you made a mistake in life? Have you ever done anything wrong? And and most most people would say, of course I've made. I mean, I make mistakes every day. People will say, or or you ask, you can ask this question to get at the other side of it. You say, are you perfect? If you ask somebody, just go up. You know, if you're sitting next to someone right now, listening to the show, just just look over them and ask them, are you perfect? And they're going to look at you, and you're going to look at them, and you're going to know the answer. I mean, nobody is per We say that all the time. Nobody's perfect. And, and that conclusion is the conclusion of a troubled conscience. That's what your troubled conscience preaches to you, that nobody is perfect. But that is not yet a terrified conscience. You see, a troubled conscience is able to recognize that I've done something wrong. But a terrified conscience is able to go one step further and recognize that not only have I done something wrong, but that I have sinned against God, a holy and righteous God, and that because of my sin, God is angry at me. Did you see the difference? I mean, if I have a troubled conscience, I just think, man, I've messed up, I've made mistakes. But if I have a terrified conscience, I'm able to say, I'm able to say that, that God has made mis that that God himself uh, is angry at me for the things that I've done, for the things that I've said, for the for the mistakes that I've made, for the for the law that I've broken, and so forth. You you, you see the difference. Now, we saw a glimpse of the terrified conscience uh, when we were reading the scripture yesterday about Jesus coming to Peter. Jesus comes to Peter, and he's sitting there in his boat, and and he preaches, and then he says to Peter, "Throw, push out the boat into the deep water, throw in your net." 
you get, and, and you'll gather up some fish, and Peter does it. Unbelievable. He does it, and he pulls up the net, and the net is full of fish, so much fish that the net is starting to break. I mean, you can imagine, here's Peter and his boat, his, his partners in this boat, you know, this 25-foot-long boat, and they have these huge nets, and they're pulling them out, and there's so many fish that it's all their strength to, to lift these fish, and their, and their, their, uh, their arms are start getting sore, and their, and their equipment is starting to strain, and they call jo- John and James and their crew out. And they get the boat, and they they they're able to lift this boat, this net full of fish onto the boat. So much fish that it, the text says that both boats start to sink because of the weight of the fish that Jesus called into the net. And Peter sees it, and he knows that this is a miracle. And look what he does: he falls down on his at Jesus' knees, and he says, "Depart from me, I'm a sinner, O Lord." That's terror. It's terror that, remember how it was with Adam and Eve in the garden? I mean, they saw that they were naked and they were troubled by it, but then they, they made fig leaves to clothe themselves, and then they think they're at peace. I mean, there they are with, in the garden, and Adam and Eve and the, and the serpent are all there together until they hear the sound of God's feet walking in the cool of the day. And now their trouble turns to terror because they realize not just they were, that they were wrong, but that God was going to be angry with them. And they run and they hide from God. It's one of the worst verses in the Bible to hear this, that Adam Adam and Eve run and hide from the presence of God in in the bushes. They should have they should have heard the sound of God and they should have rushed to Him. Should have, should have ran to, to to grab a hold of the feet of the Lord and said, look, "Look at all the things that we saw today, that we tasted today, that we did today, that we discovered today." Look, uh, and they should have gone to worship Him and and to receive His benefits and His blessings. This is how it should have been with Adam and Eve in the garden. But they hear the sound of God and they run. That's this that's spiritual death. That's a terrified conscience. That that's the difference. Not just between Adam and Eve knowing that they're naked, but now they know that God is mad, and rightly so, that God is angry, that he has wrath to visit on them, and, and, their, and their conscience goes from being troubled to being terrified. I think this is what's going on with King David in Psalm 51. You remember that Psalm 51 is the psalm that he prays when Nathan comes to him. David had... He had gone and he'd fa- he'd seen Bathsheba taking a bath on the roof. He calls her over. He acts like she's his wife and commits adultery, breaks the sixth commandment. And then it turns out that Bathsheba is now pregnant with David's David's, uh, boy, and so he tries to cover up his sin. He's got a troubled conscience. He tries to cover it up. He invites Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, home, tries to get him to go home. He refuses to do it because he's so faithful to David. So David sends back with Uriah instructions for his own murder to Joab. And so Joab has him placed at the most dangerous place of the fighting, has his men full, pull back, and Uriah is dead. So now David's broken the Sixth Commandment, the Eighth Commandment, the Fifth Commandment. He's plotted murder. He thinks he's got away with all of these things. And so God sends him, no doubt, David has a troubled conscience, but not yet terrified. And so, so God sends to David uh, Nathan, the prophet, and Nathan comes to David. You remember this very famous thing. Nathan comes to David, and he says to David, there was a man who had all these sheep, and a visitor, a, a, a friend, came to visit, and he went to the neighbor's house who had only one sheep, a sheep, one single sheep that he loved. He treated it like a pet. He was never going to slaughter that sheep. And the man who had all the sheep took the singular sheep from his neighbor and killed it for his friend. And David says, bring me that man, put him to death. And Nathan says to David, you're the man. Hmm. <laughs> Thus says the Lord, look, I gave you all these things, and now you have to go and reach and take another man's wife, put him to death. You, David, have a problem now with God. And suddenly his heart, his conscience, goes from being troubled to being utterly terrified. And he comes undone, and he prays Psalm 51, in which he prays, Against you and you only have I sinned, O Lord. Now, we look at that, Psalm 51, and we say, David, David, what are you talking about? You sinned against everybody. You sinned against Bathsheba. You sinned against Uriah. You sinned against Joab. You sinned against the men in your army. You sinned against the men of Israel. You sinned against everyone in the world. I mean, future generations now are full of this, uh, uh, have this this shameful story in their imaginations and their eyes, and now you've sinned against all of these things, and you say that you've sinned against God alone? Well, this is what a terrified conscience does. A terrified conscience knows that God himself is the problem. Uh, that, that, that God's holiness is the thing that stands between me and eternal life. A terrified conscience knows that the problem that we have runs much deeper than our own mistakes and our own sins, that the problem runs all the way up to heaven and God's own holiness. 
Now, here's why this is so important, this distinction between a troubled conscience and a terrified conscience. Because if I just think that my problem is a troubled conscience, then I'm going to think that the solution is also in me getting things straightened out. I mean, look, if the problem is that I've made mistakes, then the solution is that uh, I can fix it. I can make it better. I can do some good works to balance it out. I can make, a, I can make amends. I can, I can somehow try to tilt the scales in my own favor. You know, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. I can, I can go and I can do my good work. I can do my good deed. I can do my duty towards my neighbor and somehow it can balance it out. You see, a troubled conscience is tempted to think that because the problem is my sin, then the solution is my good works. But a terrified conscience knows better. I mean, the problem is not my sin. I mean, it is. It's, I don't have trouble apart from it. But my, tr my trouble is worse than my sin. My trouble is with the holiness of God. And if my problem is with God and his holiness, then the solution is also not going to be found with me, but to be found with God. This, uh, if there's going to be a way to get to salvation, it's going to be a way that God makes. If there's a, if there's a, a door that's going to be opened, it's not going to be opened by me. It's going to be opened by God. A terrified conscience has come to a point of despair of self. This is how our Lutheran fathers talked about it. It's beautiful that, a, that the law brings us to a despair of ourself. It brings us to the end of ourselves. It diminishes our own, our own trust and our capacity to do good, to make amends, to fix things that are broken, to make things right that have gone wrong. A terrified conscience knows that I have no hope apart from God himself. And, and, and a terrified conscience now runs to the Lord, not offering, the, the, um, uh, not offering amends, not offering corrections, not offering good works to balance out my own sins. A terrified conscience simply falls at the feet of God and begs for the only thing that we can beg for, and that's mercy. That's a, that, because that's our only hope. A, a, a terrified conscience knows that God is rightly angry and that there's nothing that I can do. There is nothing that you can do about it. Now, the reason why the Lord wants the law to be preached is not so that we would have a troubled conscience and try to make things better, but so that we would have a terrified conscience and know that we need a Savior, that we cannot save ourselves, that we have deserved God's temporal and eternal punishment, and so that we would fall on, his, on our face and beg for his mercy. And when we do that, do you know what the Lord says? The Lord says, I have had mercy on you. I mean, look at how it was with Peter who fell at the feet of Jesus at his knees and said, Depart from me, O Lord, I'm a sinner. And Jesus refused to answer his prayer. He refused to depart from Peter. He stood there with Peter and he says instead, Don't be afraid. Instead of taking himself away and the threatening, um, the, the threatening uh, specter of his holiness, instead of removing that from Peter, Jesus removes the thing that caused Peter to be terrified, that is Peter's sin. He absolved him in those words, Don't be afraid. He, instead of sending God away, he sends the thing that makes us terrified of God away, our, our sin and our death and our mistakes. The same thing happened in the Garden of Eden. When, when Adam and Eve were so uh, af afraid of the presence of God, when they were so frightened at God's presence, God didn't leave them alone, but he put enmity between Adam and Eve and between the serpent, and he went to war. So that, so that Adam and Eve leave, leave the Garden of Eden not only with the threat that God had on the day you eat of it, you will surely die. They also left with God's promise, because you ate of it, I will die. <laughs> and I'll rescue you. So to the terrified, the Lord Jesus comes and he says, don't be afraid. Don't be terrified. Your sin, which invites my wrath, that's all died for. It's all covered with my blood. It's all made right by my sacrifice. And this gospel is balm for you, for me, for all of us who have a terrified conscience. So I hope that distinction is helpful for you. The difference between a troubled conscience and a terrified conscience. The difference between thinking that we can make it right and the difference that, know, that knows that we cannot make it right and only God can make it right because a terrified conscience is ready to hear that God has made it right in Christ. <laughs> that he's made it right in his death and his resurrection and that it is made right for you. Dear friends, that's good news. 
I'm Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. You are listening to Cross Defense. We're going to go to a short break, and we're going to be back on the other side with my great friend, Pastor Jonathan Fist, talking about his book, Echo, seeing what he's up to in that. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Psalm 122, verse 1. Each weekday, the servants of God at the LCMS International Center gather together to receive the gifts of God in His Word. I invite you to join us weekdays, 10 a.m., for a live broadcast of daily chapel services on KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Did you know that your individual retirement account may make the best gift to KFUO? The IRS now allows individuals 70 and a half or older to transfer their required minimum distribution directly to charity and avoid paying the associated income tax. These gifts can provide regular long-term resources to KFUO. If you have questions about making an IRA gift to KFUO, call me, Mary, at 314-996-1518. We'll send a representative out to help answer your questions and help you establish a legacy of giving to your favorite radio station, Worldwide KFUO. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth, It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. The prophet Isaiah chapter 55 verses 10 and 11. Begin and conclude your day with the word that accomplishes the purposes for which it is sent. Morning prayer at 7 a.m. and evening prayer at 5 p.m. Weekdays on KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. The broadcasts of Morning Prayer and Evening Prayer are underwritten by Lutherans for Life. Welcome back to Cross Defense on KFU. I'm your host, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in Aurora, Colorado. And I have, hanging around, somehow on the other end of a microphone, Pastor Jonathan Fisk. Pastor Fisk, how are you? I'm doing all right, Brian. Uh, Pastor Wolf Mueller, good hey, to hear good. your voice. <laughs> Thank, yeah, you too. Thanks for thanks for being on the show. I want to talk to you about this book, uh, Echo, which is fantastic. I mean, I really, you know, you wrote another book I, which I read at some point, and I thought that's a pretty good book. But then I picked up this guy, and it's totally different. Uh, so you had Broken, which was great, but but now this is the second book, and um and as I've talked I've talked to people, I'm going to kind of start with this. Uh, who have read it? They've said, they've all commented on the same thing. They've said the same thing that you've said to me that this is a very different, this is a very different book, a very different project. What's the what's the difference between Broken and Echo? Focus. <laughs> you know, Bro- Broken was a book written by a young man. I was in my early thirties, and I aspired to be a writer and liked to write. But I, you know, the, as you age, you whatever craft you practice, you get better at it, and so. I, I, honestly, one of the, the biggest differences is that, that while Broken does have a, a real theme to it, a real direction, it, it's not as if it isn't got a locus or, or a section of ideas that it deals with. It does kind of meander and, and takes you on a, on a journey and, and finds its way as it goes. And Echo comes at you with a pretty clear plan. And that plan is uh, historic theology is, is what we have always believed as Christians, and then that means as Lutherans. Uh, but it, it's very direct, and it just moves right through, ex- uh, giving you uh, this kind of gold mine that the catechism is, and laying it out in its structure. So, and then the fact that the catechism is so structured by God, I think, and that the book's about that structure even amplifies that, so that you really never go more than a page or two in doubt of where you're going, right? Uh, and in fact, I'm at pains to try to hide from you where you're going a little bit, but it's, it's just so uh, evident what's being talked about. And Broken was, again, it was just a little more, it was, it was more like a narrative, right? It was more of, a, of, a, of an adventure. Uh, they also did deal with different topics in a sense, although they really do have the same ultimate message. But you were just talking about the conscience for a while there, and Broken very much has as its 
its fundamental concept, the freedom of the conscience of the Christian, and trying to help Christians reckon with what that means apologetically in their own hearts, like how they would make a defense of their conscience to themselves while out in the world on the basis of what Christianity means, right? So that they would not be plagued by false teaching. And Echo, while that certainly is still there as part of Christianity, its central driving point is the the centrality of Jesus of Nazareth at the heart, the beating heart of history, the beating heart of our faith, and the beating heart of the design of the world, and then how that world has been redeemed in him. That's why we have a clean conscience. That's why what Broken says about the freedom of the Christian conscience can be true. But Echo is really trying to demonstrate the reasonableness of this claim uh, and the simplicity of this claim, that it is not only historical and defensible, but that it's, it's enough for a child to learn at the most fundamental level, and it's enough to continue to challenge an adult to realize I'm always a student of this thing. I never get much further. Now, that's my opinion in answer to your question. I could be wrong. Um, I, 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 Echo is just a better book. But I think that has a lot to do with the fact that I was I was seven years older when I wrote it. But but yeah, for for what it's worth. I you start out by talking about it. So I mean, in some ways, I mean, one of the things you've always been good at. I've admired this about you, um, even though I make fun of you for it. But I have secretly. I didn't want you to know that I admire. But I, now we're talking to the world, so That's I right. admire it, it, you. But before you, this, before this, you called me your great friend, and I'm like, man, I'm not just a friend, but I'm great, right? Like I have this friend, and he's great. I have this friend, and he's regular, and Fisk is like, great. I'm friends with a great guy. Well, so, anyway. That, that, so I, yeah, I don't I'm know if the great the was further. a description of you or of the friendship. <laughs> I'm trying to no, figure that me. out. I'm starting to talk more like <laughs> Trump, you know. I got, a, oh, I got a tremendous a tremendous friend, just one of the best, and I was talking <laughs> to him the other day. So, uh, you, um, but you, 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 this talent of yours and interest of yours is by, is being able to take the language that we're used to using in the church and and just tw- twisting it, giving giving to it new words. I mean, looking at, and a lot of times you're, you know, you're peeling back, you're going to the Greek, you're pulling out the uh, the text and bringing it across a cognate, so that you're, you know, one of the one of the great dangers of theology, right, is that we become bored with it. We think that we know it. And uh, and Luther talked about that too. He says, uh, you know, we people think they read the Catechism one time and they think they've learned it, and and we can't be finished learning what God never finishes teaching. I th- in fact, don't you start the book with that phrase from yeah, with that yeah. quote from Luther? I mean, the book is That's is the great. result of fifteen years of that phrase convicting me back when I was just a seminarian and, and telling me, you know, this is you, you arrogant jerk. You think you understand this stuff. You don't have a clue, is what Luther says in the large catechism. He says it nicer than that, but in a very convicting way, and that's how I took it for myself. And so I've been on this uh, journey of sorts to try to believe that, 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 I, that there's more there than I saw when I was a bored seventh grader, you know, in a hot, dusty room on a, on a warm Wednesday afternoon, wanting to get out of there, wanting to, you know, get me confirmed so I can be done with this church stuff. There's more there. And, and going in and finding it, and then trying to, once I found it, share it. So it, it is an interest of mine in this sense. I want to understand it. <laughs> and so for me to understand it, you can't just repeat the phrases ad nauseum and expect that to give you more understanding. If you want to study something, you need more than one line about that thing. You can't just know one fact. You need a, you need a book or you need a resource. You need a series of tests or what have you. And so for me, since we are a people of the word, we live from this word, to understand this word means to find what it means. And that means more words, other words, whether they're words of history that give us the word that we have now, that study of etymology, which is a pretty boring sounding word, but, but I love it, right, that you find out where the word came from, and it helps you understand why we use this sound to mean this thing over there, uh, all the way down to other words, like in our language in English, we have so many different ways of saying the same thing. It's very unique. Not all languages are, are so uh, profuse. <laughs> uh, and, and, and yet with that, uh, we can describe things so well and, and to be able to use that. There's a great danger here, though, too. You, you told me just a moment ago, you said, you know, I twist the words. And it's like, ooh, ooh, what's that mean, right? Because historically, we have very good and important warnings from doctors of the church not to change the words. Don't tinker with the words. Because there are always arising from within the church false teachers who twist the word 
to their own destruction and the destruction of others, right? And so there is there is a danger there, but I would like to create the, or not create, but emphasize that there is a distinction between twisting and translating. And that what Echo is trying to do is is not twist the words, maybe maybe twist the sounds a little bit, but not the words. What it wants to do is to to translate the words so that I don't just have a cursory or a surface level understanding of what it means, you shall not murder, and walk away thinking, as long as I've never actually stabbed someone in the chest or shot him in the face, I'm not a murderer, right? That's what Jesus does with the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, so trying to, to take that tact, not only to you shall not murder, but to things like, things like hallowed be thy name, or things like he suffered, right? That Jesus suffered. That, to me, that's my favorite part of the whole book because it, for me, it was such a revelation to to, to see the, the suffering of Jesus as an act of righteous work that He did for me from the moment He took His first breath all the way to the last breath He took, you know, and that He was carrying the the thorns of the world all the way uh, to that cross to buy them back. That kind of stuff uh, to have those words opened up to us a little bit more. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so I don't know if I'd call it a, a gift so much. I mean, if it is for others, that's great. But for me, I'm just a dunce, and I want to understand these things, and I can't unless I have more words. And now I'm just trying to share uh, what I found. It reminds me of um, it reminds me of what Luther says in his Great Confession that he's he's worried that people are going to come around after he dies and say, "Oh, Luther didn't go far enough. He didn't know." He didn't know these things. That's why he still said that the body and blood was in the supper and things like that. And, and Luther says, I want you to know that I've, I've climbed the tree of Scripture. I've gone to the end of every branch, and I've looked at both sides of every leaf. <laughs> just, so, so that he, you know, that our investigation of the, of the Scriptures is, is a thorough investigation, that we've turned over every single word in there. We've looked at every single leaf. And I think in some ways I see this project of yours is, is going to the end of the branch of the catechism and flipping over every leaf, every word that's in there, um, and, and, um, and dislodging the, the cliches so that, you can, so that we can have a fresh take at it. So just for, as an example, I think one of the, our problems is we think of the Ten Commandments like, um, I think our common understanding of the Ten Commandments is like the rules that are posted outside of the hotel swimming pool, you know? Uh, yeah, right. Pool is open till ten o'clock. No glass allowed in swimming area. Uh, you must rest for thirty minutes before you swim. Uh, if you're under twelve, you have to have adult supervision. In other words, it's just kind of a, you know, it's just a list of do's and don'ts, and it doesn't go any further than that. You come along and you call them the ten parts of of being creation. In other words, you, you're you're just taking those ten commandments and you're pushing it down to the, you know, past the kind of. I suppose bland moralism to to the 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 very fundamental point of what it means to be created by God. So something about that. What do you? Um, well, my my thinking in that is that even even the the rules of the swimming pool, as much as I might like to have a glass to drink out of, right? There's a reason that the rule is there. So there there are no rules posted generally anywhere in life. That don't have a an assumption or a presupposition behind them. There's an there's a bit of positive information behind the do not, and that positive information, which is a known thing, that is why we would have a do not, is why we would keep the rule. And so any list of rules is going to be arbitrary. It's going to be annoying. It's like why do I have to do this if you don't have the why behind it, right? That that positive information that helps explain the the need for or the benefit of the boundary line and the boundary marker, right? So so why would you not have glass at a pool? Well, it's because in the past, people dropped their glass and it breaks. And then some of it gets in the pool and you can't get it out because then it's in the water. And then people swim and they have glass slivers in their feet and it's really awful, right? So that's why. Yeah, and, and then it's like, okay, I can see that. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Okay, well, so then let's do that with the Ten Commandments. And you find it's a little bit bigger than we want people not to have glass shards in their feet. Not that that's a bad thing. I think that's a, that's a laudable goal. But it's, it's, it's far more profound than that. It's far more, more uh, cosmological than that. That the, the presuppositions that the Ten Commandments themselves are built on are the definition of life in the universe for humans as a whole, start to finish. Right. There, there is nothing about our existence as human beings in this, I'll even go so far as to say multiverse, if you want to believe something like that exists. There is nothing that those Ten Commandments don't describe in some way. They cover 
everything, and everything dovetails into them. And that's where the genius of it is, that these categories are at once so narrow that we can think, oh, yeah, don't do that. At the other hand, they're so broad that there's nothing in life that's not encompassed by them in some way, shape, or form. That, I, I want. There's something there. I don't even... I don't even know how to get to it with a question. So maybe I just want to kind of push you in this direction. I remember um, Dr. Kleinig told me a story. Uh, or I was there. He was telling the story about um, about he when he was teaching confirmation a couple of years ago. Now, so Dr. Kleinig, for the listener, is he's a great professor of theology down in Australia. He's written numbers of commentaries. He spent most of his life preparing pastors at the seminary in Adelaide. Australia and but then he retired and he was uh, he was helping at a church and he was teaching youth confirmation which is something he hadn't done in in a generation and as he taught the catechism the the kids uh, he he kind of circled back around after it was over and he says what was your favorite part and the kids said against all of his expectations that my favorite part was the 10 commandments <laughs> which we would just i mean if you were guessing what's going to people people's favorite part is going to be the gospel the, the forgiveness of sins that i'm that i'm made new in christ and he was surprised and he said why and and the answer that he that was given is in one way or another pointing to the fact that their lives the kids lives are so disordered and so confused that to to have a sense that this universe is in fact ordered by god and that we can get access to that ordering through the ten commandments was an incredible existential relief and I think that you kind of instinctively have that sense also, and I'm wondering if you want to, I mean, th there's this way in that the, the world seems so disordered to us that we have to recover the idea that the Ten Commandments are much more than the do's and don'ts, but are the kind of fundamental cosmic realities of God's creation. Yeah, or it's OCD, right? The, the instinctive sense that you need a little more control over what's going on. Like, yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 maybe the the rise of things like obsessive compulsive disorders, uh, attention deficit disorders. I'm not convinced these are all physical maladies. Certainly, there are there are situations where they are, but there's it's such a wide sweeping thing, and I am I am convinced that it is connected to the the loss of transcendent meaning in our existence as western humans we're now kind of a, a melting pot of west and east but why why is eastern thought and eastern philosophy having such a, a powerful impact on western culture it's because it does provide some answer or at least it seeks to provide an answer to give a, a meaning for the existence here or little little thing that I heard years ago so it may not be as true as it was five six years ago when I heard it but that the the largest conversion numbers of anybody in Britain uh, to any one religion at, at that time is 20 year old white males and they're converting to Islam and it's a stunning thought uh, and the the reasoning behind it is not that Islam is true per se that's what they think but that Islam is not afraid to say that it is true it says it unabashedly it says it so much that you can leave if you, you're in my building right now and you don't like what I said then go away get out of here you infidel right and that for these young people who are swimming in tolerance right like everything is tolerated there is no rhyme or reason there is no stability there's nowhere to put your feet there's nowhere to put your hands you don't know which way is up for to have anybody just say we know what's going on and we're not going to change it that conviction alone is a powerful relief and then they'll jump into it. And then, of course, Islam does have a certain semblance of the Ten Commandments. Uh, they, they have a certain understanding or, or building upon this design, which they teach as a moral reality. And so, the, the, you know, they're drawn to that. So it's not entirely surprising to me that young people in, in the United States today who have so much freedom, uh, f freedom of thought, it really, and, and I don't mean this in a good way, like that they're not told no. <laughs> by their parents generally speaking at least until they're 16 then they try to tell them no suddenly and it's a fight right but, but they're not told no for years huh? uh, and and so they don't even they don't know they don't they, they're they're insecure because in order to learn what reality is you have to have yes and no there has to be light and darkness right you have to have on and off 
otherwise you can't understand. And that lack of understanding means like it's a it's an internal or a spiritual falling. It's like you're constantly. Uh, unable to get your bearings you know what it's like when you fall and you like reach back you know, you know a lot of people break their arm because you reach back to catch yourself in some way and if you just fall on your back you'd be fine but that's like what you're doing is you're flailing around trying to find something to hold on to and christianity has that but we also have positioned ourselves i'm not speaking for every church and every christian but as a movement within western civilization we have positioned ourselves as the only people alive who have nothing substantial to say <laughs> like the only religion that really doesn't believe anything at all. So, you know, just come be nice with us on a Sunday morning. Oh, yeah, give some money, too. It, it doesn't really work. Yeah. Sure. So, yeah? Go, I'll, go respond to that a little yep. bit. Pat, so no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the break is what I'm going to do uh, is right now and come back to talk about this on the other side. This is really great, though. I mean, are you, Pastor Fisk, uh, I'm, this is Pastor Brian Wolfman, by the way, that you're listening to, and that's Pastor Jonathan Fisk over there talking about his book Echo, which is a real gift to the church. I mean, just a a phenomenal piece of work and it's great to hear you talk about it and we're going to talk about it some more so we're going to go to the break now we'll be back in like 90 seconds something like that can't never remember how long the breaks are but i think 90 seconds stick with us be back on the other side and talk some more about this how the how how christianity has something solid not only to place our feet on to place our minds on to place our conscience on to place our trust in that's what christianity gives us that's what jesus gives us in his blood stay tuned we'll be back soon Lutheran News Digest host Kip Allen. Every day, things happen that affect the lives of Lutherans worldwide. Whether it's mercy efforts to a disaster-stricken community, threats to religious liberty, or cultural trends, World Lutheran News Digest takes an in-depth look at one issue each week as I interview newsmakers and experts. All Sarah Golseth presents a quick look at the week's news. World Lutheran News Digest may be heard every Wednesday at 2.30 and Saturday at 9.30 on Worldwide KFUO. When you went car shopping, you meant business. You ace vehicle history searches and test drives. You out salesmen to the salesman. Now you've got your wheels. If you manage that, you can get your retirement plan on track. Visiting aceyourretirement.org can help. With 401k tips and smart saving strategies, you'll have the info you need to get more for your future. Go to aceyourretirement.org. Because when it comes to speeding past financial challenges, you're an ace. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. When Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his now iconic I Have a Dream speech, it was a defining moment in the civil rights movement. A speech rich in biblical language as he quoted from numerous biblical passages, including Amos 5.24. No, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And from Isaiah 40. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. And every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain. And the crooked places will be made straight. Martin Luther King Jr. used biblical language to inspire a generation to stand up to injustice and to hope for a better future. Engage with the Bible. Let its language inspire you to create a better future. Brought to you by Museum of the Bible. Welcome back to Cross Defense. I'm Pastor Brian Wolf, the pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in Aurora, Colorado. I have Pastor Jonathan Fisk with me, uh, who is the author of this new book. My my tremendous friend, <laughs> my huge great friend, <laughs> Pastor Jonathan Fisk, and the author of this tremendous, and never better book. <laughs> and great. It's awesome. And tremendous. Uh, Echo, which is really a great book. In fact, I've been, um, I was just telling Pastor Fish, I was, um, I, I think this is going to work. We're going to try to get a copy of this book, uh, sponsored to, to every incoming freshman of the Concordia systems. We're still working on a plan to get that done, but if people are interested, I'll post something up about that on the blog, which is wolfmuller.co, W O L F M U E L L E R. Dot co. I think we'll have some details finalized tomorrow, so keep an eye out in the next week for that. I'll announce it 
here on Cross Defense as well. Uh, because I, I, this, I think this book is so helpful. I mean, one of the dangers, we were talking about this before, one of the dangers of uh, Christianity, of theology, is that we think we've learned it, and so we go through catechism class, and now we think we've got it. And, and um, we, have to, we have to fight against that. It's kind of theological sloth or boredom or Acadia, the old guys called it, and to to reinvigorate our imagination with the truths of Christianity, which which are which are not only the truest of all truths, if you can say something like that, but they are the best of all truths. The truth is always the best. Uh, the the things that are true are always the things that are the most beautiful, and that's certainly true uh, of the Ten Commandments and especially of the Creed. Uh, the 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 gift of the gospel that the Lord Jesus gives to us. Um, I'm gonna if if you're all right, Pastor Fisk, I'm gonna take a step uh, down the road here from what we were talking about before to something I want to talk about next. You all right with that? We move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want I want to say what I think is neat about your plan to to get this book in people's hands, and it's not just about you know having something that I wrote do well. That's that's a nice thing when when it is, but. Yeah, I think what the what the catechism itself has is the ability to unify people. It, it is a simple expression of the belief that Jesus says, "I will draw all men to myself, and if you love me, you will keep my words." And the catechism historically is the most boiled down words for us to be together on, for us to to have a common union with, and what Echo is trying to do is to to give us American language for those words and to have that happen to a whole generation of people at the time when they're most ready to have their minds formed it's not a book you have to be a, a hyper lutheran you know a liturgista you know a, a kind of a nazi for for worship styles uh to, to get something out of you you don't even have to be a lutheran at all i don't think i think you could be of a number of different groups and read this you'd get lutheranism out of it because the catechism is, is is the foundation but my point is you can be on different sides of the political spectrums within say the missouri synod and yet this book would bring us closer together and would enable us i think uh if we all had this mind uh, that comes from the catechism not from me but from the catechism i think we would be enabled to see where we stand in these dark and evil days and, and make a good punch at the world that's out there i'd love to see what would happen if a generation of people had that toolbox at their ready, what they would do with it. I am interested in that as well. Because, you know, we one of the problems in the church is we, I don't know, we, we, we resent the generation ahead of us and we despise the generation after us. I mean, that's what just kind of this generational pride thing that we have. And so the people in the church, you know, they look at the people that have gone on before and like, ah, they just didn't understand it. Everyone looks at the generations above and says, ah, they just didn't get it. And then we look at the generations below and we say, they'll never get it. Both of those are wrong, absolutely wrong. So we look at, we look at the generation above us and we rejoice in all the things that they could see and do, that they could suffer and endure. And then we look at the generation below us and we think, here, you know, here, here, this is the, the next generation is the generation that Jesus has chosen to handle all of the stuff that's coming at the end of the world. I mean, we think who who would who would God put to to handle the gray and, and latter days? And for a while, we could think, well, it was us. But now we're getting old, and the, another generation is being raised up. And apparently, the Lord has appointed them to deal with the end of the world, and so to to honor them for that, and to and to hand them the tools that they need um, to to not only face the judgment day, but to face the chaos that comes before the judgment day. I mean, that's really the task that the Lord has set before us. So. Uh, we got to do it. Um, okay, I'm going to read a passage from your book. This is from page... Oh, now I can't see what page it's from. It got cut up on the picture. It's about ah. the, um, the second foundational reality, and you write this. This is, in fact, oh. stunning. It's not the history of Jesus that defies the law and structure of the universe. It's not his resurrection from the dead that's unbelievable. It's not his incarnation's inversion of physics, time, and space that truly breaks the mold of human reason. Rather, it is the fact that God could have built a second creation from scratch, right at the beginning, right when we fell. He could have swept aside the old, broken, uh, the, the old broken order of the ten things and made a new order, perfected to stand on his own, but he didn't. Instead, he spoke the second foundational reality into the midst of the first one. Rather than to destroy our less than good but now worse and certainly not very good anymore universe, he fulfilled 
and completed it. He looked down on the world that wanted to be its own God, the man who wanted to replace the God who made all things, and in his mind-bending mercy, he chose to become one with us to save us from the attempt. He overturned and absorbed the thorniness of Adam, the brokenness of earth, by taking humanity up into himself. That is just... I mean, first of all, that's fantastic writing, by the way. Thank you. And second of all, it's even, I mean, the thing that you're writing about is even better. I mean, it's, it's just an amazing thing to say that God could, I mean, the surprising thing is not that Jesus became, that God became a man. The surprising thing is not that, that, uh, that, that uh, the incarnation and the death and resurrection of Jesus. The surprising thing is that it all comes from his mercy. Mm. I mean, that he could have just walloped us. He should have just walloped us. I mean, he should have ended it all right at the very beginning, but he didn't. I mean, he decided to do something different. That's phenomenal. Uh, I thought yes. you want to expand on that. Well, it's what we would do, right? We wouldn't do mercy. There's a reason that the, the name Hitler is so polemical today and that it gets thrown around, or Nazi, right? Uh, what, are the, what does that word Nazi mean today? It doesn't really mean a historical group of people who did a historical evil thing. What a Nazi is is someone who's unforgivable. They have, they have treaded over the line between good and evil to where there is nothing that can make us forgive them. What they have done is so terrible. What Hitler has done is so terrible that every human being must, from the heart, despise him. And it's sort of just kind of the way the language has come down to us now. And what's important is for you to see that in this scenario, God and you, you're Hitler. You're the Nazi. Like, you're worse. You're, you're even further removed from the good God. And his gut reaction is not to call you what you are and give you what you deserve. His gut reaction, his first step, is to save you, to love you, to forgive you. That is, that's godly, right? It's, it's inhuman at the highest level. But it's not inhuman in a sense of as if humans weren't created to have this kind of mercy. But fallen humans, we just don't know this kind of mercy. We don't. It, it doesn't come from us. Even when we show mercy, it's with hesitance uh, and with, with catches and, and limits. Right? How many times must I forgive my brother? That kind of thing. And, yeah, you're right. The most surprising, marvelous thing about God, you know, who is he? Right? I am the Lord, Yahweh. I am the Lord. Filled with steadfast love. Right? That, we don't translate that word particularly excitingly. Unyielding fidelity. A commitment that never dies. Always for you, never against you. That's who I am from the root. And, and that that's, that's why everything else that Jesus does and did and will do happens. is because his inclination uh, is to give rather than to receive. And when Jesus says it's better to give than receive, we kind of trance that around like a bunch of pious mumbo-jumbo. Yeah, I ought to give a little bit more. We should all give a little. No, he's talking about himself. He's, he didn't come to take anything. He came to give because that's what he does. And he thinks it's so good. It's so good that's all he wants to do. He never wants to receive again. And we're like, great, give us some. <laughs> right? Yeah. We just don't have any of that native yeah. give in us. The beautiful thing about the design of creation being restored to the last day is that's all we're going to know is that kind of giving. That, that's going to be what we're built from because we're going to be built from him. Yeah, it's stunning. It's, yeah, it's, Jesus says, what's, uh, who's greater, the one who sits at the table, the one who serves? But I am among you as the one who serves. The, he says it. In in yeah. Mark like this, I I did not come, I I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Is it, that this is precisely who Jesus is? So that when the prophets say stuff like, uh, "My thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts." We normally think, well, that means God is a lot smarter than us. Like God can figure out how to invent a black hole or whatever, which is true, no doubt. It's true, but that's not what it means. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts because his thoughts are on mercy. <laughs> I mean, his, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts because he says, I'm going to become one of you, bear your sin, suffer in your place, and die for you to save you. That's, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts because our thoughts are almost all law, self-centered, vindictive law, and his thoughts are gospel. I mean, his thoughts are mercy. It's just... But, and that's why it's such a surprise, right? I mean, every page of the Scripture, just like every, I mean, every page of your book has this, a little bit of this in it, too, but every page of the Scripture especially has a, has a surprise on it. I mean, this is, God never acts like how we would predict or how we would think he's going to act, but he acts totally differently because he acts in mercy. He acts in, 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 in kindness, in love, and self-sacrifice, 
like you said, he acts always in giving. Yeah, it's, it's an endless, it's an endless thing, and he has no bottom to that gift. And again, the stunning part is is this too shows us our sin, right? It shows us how how wicked we are, that we can't even conceive of that kind of giving. Uh, and yet here he is drawing us alongside himself, saying, you know, if you're not little flock, uh, I've got you. And um, yeah. I remember when you were talking about this book in the beginning. Is this? Do I remember this right or not? But did um, did it first come out? You were thinking about doing something just on the Lord's Prayer, or was the Lord's Prayer like a particularly central part of what you were thinking about? Uh yes and no. Uh, when I oh man, that's, that's a kind of a long story. When I finished Broken, I I knew I wanted to write more. It wasn't like I just had a, a book that I wrote. I have had a lifelong desire to be a what you would call a writer. It was a dream. I went to school, and before I was going to the seminary, I wanted to be a fiction writer. So I knew I wanted to write books. So when I had a first one, and it was fairly successful for for Lutheran standards, uh, like I knew I needed to write another book. Right? You just got you got to keep going. And I, I probably waited about six months before I started in on on something called Welcome to the Resistance. And I had a big plan for Welcome to the Resistance, and I, I worked on that plan, and I worked on that plan, and I fuddled with that plan for about five years and just couldn't ever get very far on it. And the plan was this. The plan was to pre- present, present you with sort of a, a handbook for Christian life, right? Or kind of everything the – sub, the subtitle, Welcome to the Resistance, The Sojourner's Guide to the Galactic War. Everything you need to know about being a Christian in an age of darkness and decay kind of summed up. And I was using as my model the idea that I think made Rick Warren's purpose-driven life so very successful. What Rick Warren's purpose-driven life is, more or less, is a Baptist dogmatics that doesn't ever tell you it's a Baptist dogmatics. It instead just tells you that it's practical truth. And and it brings you a bunch of assumptions from, from Baptist theology, some of which is biblical and some of which is not. So, well, go. it'd be great to do that with Lutheran theology, because then you'd have the real deal, right? Uh, to have a, a Lutheran dogmatics, which is not uh, going to tell you that you're ab- absorbing Lutheran doctrine in. So I'm working on this thing. But the thing is, because Warren's work was so so great, so good, um, so not great and good in, in the sense that I agree with it, but it's popular, it did so well, I sort of was using his book as a model. And so I was using his categories, like the big setup of the whole book was sort of similar to the way he set his book up. And I kept banging my head against this thing. And, I, and then finally I, I sat back and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. If he's bringing me a Baptist dogmatics, that, that means it's not like he just, it's just the words on the page are, are Baptist understanding. It means all the categories are Baptist categories. Where he starts is where Baptist theology starts, and where he finishes is where Baptist theology w- wants to finish. So I can't use his book as a model at all. I have to find Lutheran categories and, and, and put them in that uh, function. So I'm like, okay, well, what do I, do I use Dr. Francis Pieper's Christian dogmatics? Is, is that what we do? And it kind of just dawned on me, wait a minute. Our catechism is our categories. It's all of them. It's such a simple little little tool, right? And, and so that what happened then, in a sense, was I realized that, that this trying to teach the theology of the catechism was shoved inside of this other handbook for living thing that I had. And at the same time, this is where the Lord's Prayer part comes in, right? Right as I'm having this, this revelation, uh, I, uh, I'm asked to speak at the Issues at Center of Making the Case Conference. It's about three years ago now. And they asked you, if I recall, to talk about eschatology in the book of Revelation, which was like my, that's like my, my cherry-picked plan, right? That's what I like to do, is talk about Revelation. It's, it's uh, my, my hobby. And I'm like, oh, man, Brian got a good topic. What are you going to give me? And, and they asked me to talk about the Lord's Prayer. And I know nothing about the Lord's Prayer. Like, I, I, I couldn't talk for five minutes about the Lord's Prayer. I mean, I could teach catechism class on it, right? But it, it, I wasn't ready to, to really dive into an hour-long presentation on this in front of a, a big audience. But as I then studied and prepared for that, I began to really just find things in the Lord's Prayer from the large catechism largely, but, but elsewhere, that I had never seen before. And, and, and then that talk, which was received very well, dovetailed into me using Ten Commandments, Creed, and Lord's Prayer as the, the, the totality of this book. So really the back end of this book is a flushing out of that talk. And then the front end of this book and all these pictures, they're connected to another thing, uh, that when I started teaching confirmation class years ago, 
uh, I would use these stick figures to kind of try to draw pictures of each commandment or each piece that was happening to try to give a, a visual understanding, not so much so that the kids listening would understand it, but so that I could understand while I was talking. I, you're like this too, I think, right? When you talk, you run on a whiteboard so that you can remember what you're saying. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and so that it makes sense to you, even if no one else gets it. And so I'd, I'd set up and eventually got into this thing where I could do the catechism in an hour with these stick figures. So I took all of these pieces and pulled them all together uh, into this book. And I really wrote the thing in about a year because it was all uh, already set there. And I just if I had to figure out I can't do it in, in Rick Warren's dogmatic categories. I got to put it instead uh, in our category. And once I realized that, uh, the thing just kind of took on a life of its own. So I don't know if that, if that was what you wanted as an answer, but there's your, there's your author's interesting little bit about where the book came from. That's fantastic. I appreciate that. Pastor Jonathan Fisk, author of Echo. Pastor Brian Wolfman, they're here on Cross Defense. we got to get this book out, so stay tuned for plans for that. We'll talk about it more next week. Talk to you soon. Rock on. You've been listening to Cross Defense. Produced by Worldwide KFUO, the official broadcast ministry of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Your support is vital for this program to continue. To learn about giving opportunities, call Mary at 314-996-1518. Or you can make a gift safe, secure, and easily online at kfuo.org. Thank you for listening and supporting Cross Defense on Worldwide KFUO.